introduce our next guest. Uh, we have uh, former governor and, and former Senator uh, George Allen. So welcome, I appreciate your being on the show, Governor. Well, great to be with you, Mark and Dwight and whoever else is watching this podcast. I appreciate your resourcefulness and trying to get this information out to, to people who are, are looking, I think, like a lot of us, to reopening and uncaging American lives and livelihoods. And uh, it's a pleasure to be on this uh, podcast in that I want to actually hear from all of y'all. And whether we hear it in this podcast or not, uh, I've been appointed to a really great uh, heritage initiative. It's called the National Coronavirus Recovery Commission. And we can discuss this during all our, our time here, but if people have ideas, constructive ideas, uh, that we, we ought to be looking for in our commission, which is putting together ideas that can more promptly reopen America's economy for lives and livelihoods. And you can go to coronaviruscommission.com, coronaviruscommission.com and share your ideas with us on this. And uh, let me just broadly say what I think, and it was great to listen to Dr. Ackerman. I was taking notes uh, from his wow. perspectives and there's certain things that need to be done in my view right now that urgently still get the, the N95 masks, the uh, protective equipment uh, to those on the front lines and all the, the docs or doctors, nurses, healthcare providers are really patriotically and courageously uh, risking their lives or their health uh, to help others and care for others. And we all we salute all of them wherever they are in our country. And uh, on the next stage, I think for reopening, and I, I agree with Dr. Ackerman, it's going to be done by governors looking at the differences in their states. And that's the way it ought to be done. And as Dr. Ackerman said, every place isn't the same. You all asked that same question. Uh, to Ocean City, and Baltimore and Montgomery County and Cumberland County, Maryland uh, are not the same, just like New York City's different than Sioux City or Gate City or Oklahoma City. And uh, I think the governors are gonna look to reopen and they're gonna do it on a community or region by region basis. One of the things that I think is absolutely essential is we get more of these rapid tests out. This has been a game changer, this rapid test identifying whether somebody's got this COVID-19 or not. Abbott Labs is the one who uh, developed this. And I think as if, whether it's that or something similar that you can find out within 15 minutes whether or not you have this virus rather than sending the swab off somewhere to a lab and you find out five days later. Well, that's too late if you want to stop the spread of it. The other thing that we've learned from this, and I, I would have loved to ask Dr. Ackerman, but we'll all have to look at the concept of proportionality uh, here. And what I want to bring to this National Coronavirus Recovery Commission is the concept of positive constructive ideas, a positive outlook, but also an idea of balance and proportionality uh, to all this. And what we're learning is, as, I, as Dr. Ackerman said, the places that are most dangerous are crowded cities. And New York City is as crowded as any city in our country. And then mass transit or public transportation is another another major factor and that's why you're seeing it worse in every state you can look at you can look at north carolina it's raleigh durham area and the charlotte area in virginia it's northern virginia the richmond area those are the top two areas and but then you can see some places that have an ab, uh, abnormality to it for example the williamsburg area in virginia has a lot of cases but where you have the worst cases of all, the highest death rate, the highest mortality rates are these senior centers, whatever you want to call them, uh, nursing homes, long-term care facilities. There's one in Henrico County right outside of Richmond. Well over 40 people have died there. It's actually worse loss than that first one in Seattle, Washington. And so in, in my view, as we, as we reopen our society and our economy, and stop this devastation of, of livelihoods and, and of lives, uh, I think those who are most vulnerable need to be protected, even as you open up. And, and we know who are the most vulnerable. It's those generally 
who have diabetes, who have what you might call pre-existing conditions, hypertension, high blood pressure, uh, maybe heart diseases, anything dealing with one's lungs. And those, for the most part, over 60 and particularly over 70 years old. And those who are most vulnerable, the people who are most vulnerable ought to be protected. Meanwhile, I think we sh certainly sooner rather than later need to un uncage Americans and their jobs. And when you have governments saying, well, this is an essential business and this is a non-essential business. Well, these, not, these so called decreed non-essential businesses, the people who own those businesses, they're mostly small businesses, it's really essential to them. And it's really an essential business to the hundreds, if not thousands, there's thousands of people who work for these businesses. And so I think we'll still have social distancing. I think uh, what the doctor said, you need to wash your hands more frequently, uh, practice better hygiene, sanitation will be important. And But I think also important in the midst of this is getting distributed, get manufactured and distributed literally millions, hundreds of millions of these instant tests so people can determine whether or not they have it. And in fact, Say, the, uh, say somebody's got a business where you have customers coming in, they'll want to test their employees to make sure that their employees don't have the disease because they'll be worried about liability that if one of their employees passed it on to a customer, then they'll say, well, it's, it's the fault of the business. So everyone is going to have to slowly, we're never going to get back to norm the, the way it was before. This is going to change a lot of things uh, in our way of life. Teleworking is going to be more commonplace, I think. I've, I've been an advocate of teleworking for 30 years, and I think that'll be more prevalent. Distance learning will become more prevalent. Uh, and I think there's going to be just a, a greater awareness of what needs to be done to, to try to stop getting any diseases. And when this is all over with, and I've been the sooner the better, and it'll get phased out or reopen across our country, you know, community by community, region by region, and ultimately state by state. I hope that never again do we have to have this kind of response where the governments at the federal and the state levels are shutting down our economy and devastating lives and livelihoods. There's got to be a better way of doing this and than, than this approach. And I know we're flying blind. We're still in the middle of it. But uh, what we aim to do with the national coronavirus Recovery Commission is to give ideas of what needs to be done in the future uh, to make sure that our economy, because you, you have to have a strong economy to have strong, uh, safe uh, healthcare system, and you need to have a healthy people uh, for a healthy economy as well. The, the one thing that I think we can learn from all of this is to compare it to flu seasons that have anywhere from 20 to 70,000 deaths a year in the United States. But one thing that is, is really uh, grating to me, and I think a lot of other people, is how much we are dependent on China and some undependable countries for our medicines, for our pharmaceuticals, for our devices. And uh, you all have heard me talk about energy independence, and we're now energy independent. We need to be also for our healthcare and medicines, uh, you know, health-wise or, or pharmaceutically uh, independent. And we need to have the right policies, the tax, the regulatory policies to say, let's be making the, these medicines, these drugs, these pharmaceuticals and devices here in the United States, or at least with a country, say it's Canada or Mexico or other countries that are allies, rather than being vulnerable to a country uh, such as China, that doesn't necessarily, I'm being diplomatic, that doesn't necessarily, number one, they don't share our values. And secondly, no one would ever consider them. In you know, speaking of China, Governor, uh, one thing I've always said is uh, we never would have given any of the treatments we're giving to China to the Soviet empire back in the days. I mean, have, I, you know, China is still red. They're still communists. You know, they still say nobody died at Tiananmen Square. They still make stuff up. Um, I, th I think we should do tax incentives for business to leave China, I think, uh, tax credits. Uh, I think the president's uh, right on the money of what he wants to do. I mean, if you t people, they, you know, the left likes to scare you by saying the iPhone is going to cost you $5,000, you know? Well, you know, the market will determine that if it's $5,000, 
if you want to pay five grand for a phone, go more power to you. You go buy the phone. Otherwise, you know, they'll have to figure out a way to make the phone cheaper. They could make it in South Korea where their competitors' phones made the uh, Samsung uh, and the Android phones, uh, which is their biggest competitor. And it's about the same price or it might be a little less. Marcus, you might know about that. Is that phone cheaper than the iPhone a little bit or is it about the same price? <laughs> Well, I, I, I think you know, regardless I think of that, the cost, yeah. we, once, we once did have a lot of, and it, Dwight, here's your point, <laughs> is that we got to make America, one of the, the tax reform that was passed a few years ago, the U, U.S. used to have the highest tax on incorporated businesses in the world. We're now better than average. And so on tax policies, that's fine. And so we're better there. But I think what you said is right. And that is, to make sure that our, our, our tax credits for, say, research and development and the taxes for pharmaceutical manufacturers or, or for medical device manufacturers uh, is as competitive as any in the world. So much of manufacturing these days is, is modern manufacturing. And so the labor costs, that lead, the people that are getting hired in manufacturing need great skills. And I think for the long-term job growth of our country, and our national security, it ought to be a government policy that we want to make sure that everything that we're doing by policies in the U.S. It makes it an attractive makes it attractive to be here in the United States of America. And then let, let different states compete for those facilities. Maryland actually has a lot of uh, pharmaceutical and, and uh, medical uh, expertise. You have the National Institutes of Health, Johns Hopkins. University and others, and so there. You know, your taxes are too high, and you don't have right to work laws. But regardless, <laughs> the point is, is that I guarantee you, the states that win in getting these pharmaceuticals will be states like Texas and Tennessee and Florida, and states that have no state income tax, and they're very good for business. And North Carolina does mm -hmm. well as uh, also. But the the point is, is as a national policy, we ought to say never again. Are we going to shut down our country over, over a virus? But more importantly, and as a long-term job growth approach and national security issue, just like energy independence, we wanted no longer to be vulnerable to hostile, volatile, and unfriendly governments, and we are now energy independent, thanks to the creativity and innovation of hydraulic fracking and horizontal drilling and all the rest. That, that's a geological and technical issue. This one, one time, at one time in our country, Puerto Rico, because of the tax laws, was a great place for pharmaceutical manufacturing. And so they're saying, oh, let's do this again uh, for Puerto Rico, which is fine. That would be great. But why not make the whole United States and our territories uh, much more attractive for, for pharmaceutical manufacturing? Governor, I wanted to draw on your experience as a governor. Um, certainly governors are very much on the front line of these kinds of crises. Obviously, this was an unusual one, but it comes in, in different shapes and sizes and, and, and kinds of emergencies. And I'm sure you, you thought about this as a governor. Do you have any kind of advice to governors as to how to proceed and how to respond to situations like this? Well, hello to Nicole, who uh, supposedly just said, said howdy. Yeah. Uh, I think the governors, Governor Hogan and all the governors are, are doing their best. I uh, may do things differently. I don't think at this point I'd want to make a, a public statement of criticism of any, maybe to be positive about. I like the approach that Governor Abbott of Texas has been taking. I think the governor of, of North Carolina, where, where the way he shut things down were for periods of time, say for two weeks as opposed to shutting things down for, for two months. Why don't you see what the data is? I think you're going to, and in fact, Governor, just before I got on this, I was listening to uh, Fox Business, and they said the governor of Oregon says, well, we're not going to open up Oregon by, by and, and Western Oregon is completely different than the coastal area. Right. Uh, and they said, well, the whole state has to be treated the same. Well, I don't think the whole state is the same. That's up to the governor of Oregon. Whereas Newsom, the governor of California, is saying, well, there's different areas uh, that can be opened differently, which I, that's the approach I would take. Is that, all right, well, you, know, you have certain areas, and you all alluded to this, and, and Dr. Ackerman brought it up, 
some rural areas, they don't have any problems with this. Uh, and, and so you treat different regions of your state uh, differently. Then you get in a place, here's another thing for competition uh, for in business is say you have a place like Bristol, which is on you know, the state street goes right. You know, one side of the road is Tennessee, the other side is Virginia. Well, if Tennessee opens up the Tennessee side and Virginia is still closed down, that's just going to have an exodus of people going to, to businesses on the Tennessee side. And so sometimes you're going to have to work across uh, state lines. I think, for example, uh, for Maryland in the counties, Montgomery County, Prince George's County, Arlington, Alexandria, Fairfax, Loudoun, maybe Prince William, that, you know, the whole district of, and the district itself probably want to have something that they work in concert in the so-called DMV area. Uh, which which is, is fine and logical, and, and especially since you have the public, you know, the whole metro system, the people probably aren't going to use as much in, in fear of disease, but I think it's a cleaner system than what they have up in New York City, where you, you, know, you used to see uh, videotapes of rats eating pizza and all, all the rest of the stuff you'd see in the, in the New York City subways, which have not never been looked upon as fat fastidious clean places uh more like I, I think the new yorkers would agree with you it's it, <laughs> the subways are not you know, fastidious the one, thing, the, one, the one thing about new york though as bad as they were hit in new york city and uh new jersey and connecticut the ones who survived and here's the reality is 97 percent of the people who get this disease are going to live it's it's not just if you get the disease it doesn't mean you're going to die if they have those antibodies, their blood's going to be really, really valuable blood, and they're going to be immune from it, not having to wait for this vaccine that'll probably uh, take at least a year. The shorter term medical approach is an antiviral therapeutic, and, and that could be developed in the next four to six months to, to uh, be in effect and helpful before the recurrence that is likely to occur to some extent up in, in the in the winter months later this year. Well, we certainly look forward to your commission that you're serving on with uh, uh, coming up with suggestions. I'm, I'm struck by the fact that in February, uh, the, the advice was that masks wouldn't help you. And then in April, that got changed. And, and there was some recognition that masks could be helpful. Um, so um, hopefully- well, I, I I keep my neckerchief around here. That that works too. <laughs> it's not quite as good as what they want. But, the, you know, here's the thing that, it, thank goodness, and it, it, one thing that would have been great is if we had stopped, but, and it got criticized, the president stopped travel out of China. That was actually uh, a really good thing mm -hmm. that he had done that. And sure, a lot of things could have been done a little bit earlier, but that was a really important one to do. And then shutting down travel out of Europe and then later Ireland and, and uh, Great Britain uh, from it. But I think people have learned and I think that we need to, do, it's gonna change our lives. We're gonna be cleaner. We're gonna have more sanitation. We're gonna be in a depression in some segments of our society, of our economy, sadly enough, until a, a vaccine is found. There's gonna be more people some people who are risk adverse and some who are less risk adverse. And so even when it opens up, there are gonna be people who are very, very cautious and others that say, well, let's get after it. It's like Farragut and Mobile Bay, Danver torpedoes, full steam ahead. I just would like to see uh, the American people and our livelihoods uncaged sooner than later, safely with a special protection for those who are most vulnerable and others practicing uh, more safe ways of social distancing. People aren't gonna be shaking hands, they're gonna salute, they're gonna wave, they're gonna bow, um, and just say howdy to folks. Uh, there you go. It's a, it, it's, that's the way to go. And then the goal is, of course, you gotta get the football season uh, going this <laughs> far. Yeah. Marcus, it, you had a question. It, yeah. It, it, um, okay. What you were uh, talking about, about the, the regional approach, it, um, I thought is uh, uh, um, fascinating and pretty spot on in that when you look at, um, you know, how it affects the, the Washington metro area of, of 
North Virginia, Washington, and Maryland, and the Washington Baltimore corridor. Um, that approach might be different than um, the western part of more rural parts of Virginia, western Maryland, or the eastern shore. Um, and then, you know, jumpstarting the economy in those different areas might look a little bit different. And I thought I think that's that's a, that's a pretty fascinating point. Um, in additionally, though, I, I was wondering as how might um, small businesses and technology companies that deal with um, either implementing software or, in some sense, geospatial software, you know, mapping um, and, and trading um, mapping data or just exchanging data, how could maybe they help um, with the overall efforts? It seems like- Oh, oh go ahead. No, I mean, it seems like there's, there's a lot of possibilities there as far as um, trying to, to, to drill down on where you can you can focus your your efforts where there you know the various um, infection rates and and you know digging into that data uh, or just how can um, the sort of um, information technology and cybersecurity community as a whole um, help with the uh, the I want to say restarting of um, the economy. That's a really great question. We're going to reopen our economy, but in the midst of reopening our society, you still want an accurate data. The data everyone's getting now is it seems like at least a day old or some of it on, on the fatality rates or fatalities. They don't even bother with rates. They make us have to do the calculations on it because people will see, gosh, the fatality rates, probably the worst anywhere in our country is around 5%. And there's other places it's less than 1%, but that depends on who actually gets it, uh, gets the, the disease. Here's where I think technology can help. And obviously the, the modeling on, on this has been a failure. It's been uh, grossly overstated. Uh, and they, and they can, but it's based upon data and their suppositions. And what those suppositions are, you know, that, that's the results you're gonna get. And, you know, they say, Dan, I'm not gonna use the term on this, but, you know, such and such in, such and such out. Uh, so I think there's, there's, there's ways, I think, that you can get this information quickly. And so you don't need humans doing it. It's just interacting with data as it gets into one system, it gets it put into another. And then the key for leaders to understand what is happening, I have these flags above me, these are countries that supported the U.S. after 9-11. But, uh, but you want to flag flagging things. There's a, there's a company I know, Singlifix. They're actually out of Arlington. And they can have different colored flags and by whatever metrics you're caring about is whether it's a, a spike in the number of reported cases, a spike in the number of deaths, uh, say a, a, a decrease in the number of available beds or ventilators or whatever, whatever metrics you want that can help someone analyze data. And the other data that I think is really important that is missing is right now that the, the studies and all the stats are county by county, and they'll consider a city a county. And that's all very interesting. But for people really to know what's going on, you'd want to make it almost by zip code or by census tract. So if you live in, I live in Virginia Beach now, which is a very big, it's the largest land area city. And there's part of half of it, more than half of it's rural countryside. Then there's a beach area, then there's the inside parts, and then there's a town center area and different things. Or, or just take Montgomery County. Let me just take your county, Montgomery County, Maryland. There's a big difference where you are. So if, if, if there's a problem in Bethesda, that may not be the biggest concern for people in Potomac. But if there's an outbreak in Potomac and nothing in Silver Spring or nothing in Bethesda. Actually, Governor, the, in Maryland, we have broken out the statistics by, by zip code. Great. And it is fa some of the issues that you're addressing have been really kind of fascinating because of precisely those variations that. All right, we need to learn what or whatever what? you're doing there in Maryland. Tell the folks in Virginia to do it. Uh, <laughs> that sounds... that, that, and but again, if you have technology back to the question, right. You have Technology, then that and but it's not just looking at a chart of figures and you just think, 
all right, well, there's that many in this zip code. There are ways of, of having a notification, a flagging uh, for deciders, for public servants who have to make decisions to help them understand what is happening with literally thousands and thousands of different data points that if you're just looking at numbers uh, or even percentages, it'll be difficult, but it helps, technology will help uh, decision makers make better informed decisions sooner, quicker, and more accurately, and help get assets where the assets need to be and attention where the attention needs to be, rather than a broad brush approach that may help some and be an unnecessary pain for others. Great. Well, I, we've come up towards the end of our uh, time, but we really appreciate you've given us a lot to think, of, think about, but also a lot to hope because I think you're asking the right questions as, you know, what can we do to get going again, which is, I think, a, something a lot of us are all looking to do and um, to do it, though, in a safe way. So thank you very much for coming on the show, Governor. Thank you, well, Governor. Thank, thank all of you all, and I, I commend you all with the Prince, whether you're people listening from Prince George's, but I suspect there are some from Arizona apparently, but yeah. mostly Montgomery County, uh, Maryland folks. And thanks for your leadership and stay positive, stay sane and keep your spirit strong. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Governor. Adios. Okay. Hey. Okay, so that is it for this episode of Doctor Politics and Next the, week we have a no, not Doctor Politics. Line. Direct line. line. Come direct line. I did that last <laughs> week also. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay.